probably 90% of your prospects are emailing while they're on the phone with you. And you know, the really sad part, my sales friends, probably half of you are doing the same thing. The future of marketing is marketing influencers, says today's Ask an Expert. And those influencers are your own employees. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propella Media. And today I sit down with Jake Dunlap. Jake is the founder and CEO of a sales consultancy firm called Scaled. They work with organizations like Microsoft, ADP, and the Oakland Athletics. Today, we're going to talk about the importance of personal brand versus organizational. It's something they took to heart over two years ago, and now it's paying massive dividends. They're seeing over seven figures in new revenue from free organic inbound searches. We're also going to talk about why you don't need to solve all of your clients' problems. Jake makes the case that over 99% of business problems have already been solved. All you need to do is be proficient with YouTube and Google to find the answers. In fact, Jake believes so strongly that this is the best path forward that they should be teaching it in school. And finally, we're going to talk about what dating can do to help you improve your outbound LinkedIn strategy. So let's hear what Jake has to say. If you like what you do here today, make sure you hit the like button, add a comment if you have a question, and let's jump right in. Jake, thanks so much for coming on our Ask an Expert podcast. Awesome, man. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so I want to start first with you. Um, you have an illustrious career, a well-tenured. Uh, I want to just talk about you personally. Who is Jake? What makes Jake's tick? Where's the drive come from? You know, it's a really interesting question. And I've never really, it's just recently I've started to talk a little bit about me and, and you know, kind of my background. So, you know, I didn't, I, my, my grandfather was a, an entrepreneur. I didn't really have any um, I never really thought that was going to be the path that I'd start my own company. You know, I grew up in the Midwest, you call it lower middle class. You grew up in Kansas city, go chiefs. Um, and you know, went to college in Missouri, uh, got into sales then. And really I'll tell you kind of what, what happened for me is I was just naturally, I had a lot of natural talent and, and the talent I really had is I didn't give a shit. Right. You, I don't know if we believe that or what. what no, it. no, we're, uh, we're fluent in <laughs> French here. So, so, um, you know, that I realized that I just was able to not take rejection the same way other people took it. I was able to, um, I started to read, you know, my first job out of college about sales and techniques. I was like, wow, like this is like a, a science. And so really I just, it kind of is a lot of people like fall into sales. For me, it was more of a, as I looked at where my strengths were and, and sales checked a lot of those boxes. I was naturally a curious person. Um, I enjoyed the art and the science component of it. And so for me, um, I didn't realize that I'd been doing that my whole life. My mom used to call me a know, a know it all because I had opinions and, uh, you know, et cetera. And so it just kind of, it ended up being a really logical fit. And so over the course of my career, you know, I've led many sales teams, built out multiple sales organizations. And now, you know, I'm leading a, you know, top sales consulting firm and, and really trying to create the future of sales and, where I think it's going to head in 2021. So it's been a, a crazy journey. We can go deep at any point of it, but you know, for me, it was a very intentional career path where I think a lot of people, you know, end up falling into it. For me, I think I saw the beauty in it and the true profession in what it means to be in, um, you know, an excellent sales leader and salesperson. Right. Okay. So I'm curious as far as like not giving a shit, at what point in life did you realize that was really an asset of yours where, Hey, I know what I'm passionate about. I know what I'm interested in. Um, was there a discovery or is it just something like, Hey, I'm following the beat of my own drum. Uh, that's a real, I don't know if I've ever realized it. You know, I think, I think I do know that, look, I have the ability to just speak my mind more freely than others. Right. Um, but you know what I, what I realized, I mean, maybe there was a point in time where it's like, well, what's the alternative? You know, maybe it was high school. Actually, maybe that's it. Maybe I, I do. I think maybe I do remember some moments in high school where I'm like, okay, so you know, you're, you're an athlete, you're doing this stuff. Like you can either be this wallflower, like why not try to be more outgoing? You know, I, I think there's maybe a little bit of intention there, right? Okay. At, at some point. And that's also when I switched from being Jacob to Jake. Maybe that, maybe actually that's the moment. You know, you're, you're going to be the first person to document this. There was a moment in time when I was started at my junior year in high school and I started correcting people from it's Jake, not Jacob or Jake. And maybe when Jake was formed, <laughs> that's when, that's when this, this new persona of, you know, like, you know, whatever, I'll just do whatever and sure. let the consequences fall. 
So that's interesting. I went through the same transformation uh, and, and there was probably this light bulb moment and it was when I went from Josh to Joshua. So like, it's, it's very funny that we had these like- You went the opposite. Yeah, yeah I, I did go to the opposite. I'm like, hey, you know, there's a lot of Josh, I'm born in the seventies, a lot of Josh's out there. I'm like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick it out there and go full Joshua. So um, damn or be damned. So, um, I well, I want to talk about, you know, you did start off um, well-rounded career, you know, right around 2010, I'm assuming 2011, wheels start turning. You're starting to think about, hey, I want to actually stake my own land. I want to I wanna start my own thing. Walk me through that process from when you're working from somebody to where you're starting to think about, hey, I can do this. And then what was that process like to where you are now? Yeah, it, it, that's an interesting time, man. Yes, from, you know, I worked, I was really fortunate. I, I didn't realize it at the time. You know, I started my, my sales career in professional sports. So I worked for a major league baseball team, then an, an NHL team. And then that, that goes back to, yeah, that was the first time I was fired because I told my boss to F off. I thought we were buddies and joking, but he didn't take it that way. Um, and then I kind of fell into, you know, an amazing opera, what turned out to be a career and life defining opportunity at career builder, which at the time was the largest job site, slightly larger even than monster. And that was Oh six Oh seven. And then, you know, the economy hit, right. Yeah. And, but my team between Oh seven and Oh eight, and then I made a, a move into the field in Oh nine, when the, the things were the worst, we were the number one team in the company. And I started to realize like, hey, I've got this kind of process down. And there was a moment that also happened at Career Builder where I had a director, my boss's boss, when I was a, a frontline rep for the first few months, um, who, who, who got me to buy into the process of sales. He got me to buy into this, this, the scientific. And how he did it is I was the second to last person to close a deal. I hadn't closed the deal yet. And I thought I was God's gift to sales. I'm like, oh my God, why haven't I closed a deal here? Right. And he said... Jake, I listen to your calls. Why aren't you following the process and the script? I'm like, the script, Joshua. <laughs> I'm Jake Dunlap. Script. You know, he's like, dude, do you think we train a thousand salespeople on this because we're stupid? Do you think that we do this because we don't know what we're doing? And it was the most massive light bulb moment. I think about that moment frequently in these types of conversations. And that's when I realized there's a process behind it. So over the course of the next you know, three years at Career Builder, that then gave me the opportunity to go and kind of put my own spin on that process when I went to Glassdoor. So as the vice president of sales at Glassdoor, I took that co company from zero to a million dollars in MRR in, in about a year. Okay. You know, we closed 24 of the Fortune 100 with this process, right? Like, right, right. And, and the ability to move people through from point A to point B, then um, went to do the same thing for their startup out in New York. And... Um, got fired from there too. I made the, the CF, the CF, I sucked at politics. Okay. And so when you ask about why did I decide this was not some divine thing, right? Everyone now wants to be an entrepreneur. I want to be a business owner, right? By the way, you don't know what you're signing up for. We can go deep <laughs> on that. We can go deep on that next and what that actually means. But for me, it was like, look, I saw after that second stint as a VP of sales, I saw my life laid out in front of me. And I said, look, you know, and, and I was very fortunate. Career Builder paid. I got my MBA um, at Arizona State when I was in Phoenix. Um, and, you know, I was like, man, is this it, dude? I'm going to keep being a VP of sales at tech companies, get fired every two to four years for a slightly older white male, um, which is kind of the Silicon Valley playbook. Sure. And no matter how good I do, no matter how good I do, I, I've never, it's never been about performance. I just sucked at politics. And I realized like, you know what? I love this work. I love the building and the scaling and the process and I've developed and I'm really good at it. Why am I making other people money? The funny part is now as a business owner, you pay everybody else. So like it's a whole, it's a, it's a whole other way to flip the, the, the spectrum. But, yeah. but that was really it for me, man. And, and I think the journey is important that I, I didn't, I didn't have grand aspiration, uh, aspirations to start my own company, to be an entrepreneur, none of that. I, what I just had a very real talk with myself after kind of my second stint and it, it didn't last, it lasted a year. And I was like, man, like you know, I crushed the numbers, built the team, but still like the Paul, I just suck so bad at politics. And I just realized like, man, this is going to be it for you, dude. You know, and the risk was low too, you know, as an agency owner, you get that. Like, look, I could go get a job tomorrow being a VP of sales and making a ton of money, more money than I make now. Okay. Right. So th th there's a low risk to initially, but I was all in on day one. I knew as you know, you know, there's a couple of times in the first couple of years, I flirted with a few companies, maybe going back in house, but every time it would get to the last step and I'm like, 
nah, no, no, no. What's going to be different? Probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about politicking because uh, I think that, you know, as I've risen through the ranks, uh, I don't know. I've, I've been pretty good at playing the game um, yeah. and, and the nuance of it. Uh, but what I've realized is there's there's different politics. So what is the politics of of scaled? Right. Like what what you guys clearly have something, but it's different than your average firm. So what is it that sets you guys um, and just for everybody out there, scaled is, is the agency that you own. Um, what what sets you guys apart? What is the differentiator? I, I love that question. Um... I think there's a couple of things that set, sets apart. It's a really good question. I don't know if anybody's like asked me that that specific question before. For me, I think there's a few things. One, all of our consultants are ex-sales leaders. Okay. These are people. These are practitioners. Yeah. We don't hire theorists, they, you know, like McKinsey or Accenture. Yeah. You know, for some person who hasn't been in the game for however many years, right. and that allows us to compete. You know, for bigger deals with those individuals. We have the size, you know, we're, if you count kind of all in, we're almost, you know, 35 people. So, you know, we can beat out the, the one or two or five man shop, yeah. you know, because we have expertise, you know, it's like, great. You have an outbound problem. Let's get somebody to solve that problem 10 times, yeah. you know, a oh, great, you have a SMB tactical sales problem. Cool. These three people have done that seven times over. Right. So I think we've got some very specific expertise that you're just not going to find in any other consulting firm. And I think, the other part is, um, you know, we are really at the forefront of sales and sales tech, meaning, you know, we have done hundreds upon hundreds of sales tech implementations. And so I think we've got this mix of both being process, really, really good at building repeatable processes right. across the sales funnel and understanding how to not just do it with people, which typically sales, how do you solve a sales problem? You throw more bodies at it. Yeah. And that's the, the 2000s, early 2010 ways of thinking about it. That's not how you build a modern sales. So I, I think those are the two main characteristics, the two main things that really, you know, set us apart. Okay. So I want to go back to something you talked about earlier, which is um, you, you were gifted in sales, um, but suddenly you get to career builder and you hit, you know, kind of a, a glass ceiling, if you may, right? Like what's happening? Like, what, why is it not working? Um, and I love this epiphany moment that you have and you still reflect on, which is, hey, we built a process. We've hired and trained thousands of reps. Like a sales process is a great thing to have. How do you evaluate a great process in an organic evolutionary process? You know, how is it that you continually look to refine it? Because things do change. And obviously we're on the mother of, you know, all disruptions of years. How, what is your guys' process to evaluate, hey, is this still the golden ticket or do we need to retool this? I love that question. Uh, for It never stops, dude. It never stops. The key is, here, just, here's how you have to just think, this is about life, but sales, the sales process, it's the same way. Marketing already has this figured out. Um, look, you, know, do you, you, you do a performance campaign. Mm -hmm. You just set it and forget it? <laughs> no. You opt, you're, you're constantly setting new baselines and A-B testing. Sales just moves slower, but I just, I don't know what, I'm, maybe it's the way I'm hardwired. Right. I'm always looking to break it. Cool, I've got the baseline. Now this, this thing feels like it's ready to be broke. Let's okay. break that, okay. new baseline. Let's break this thing, new baseline. Let, like, this is life. And it's why, you know, you talked a little bit about this, you know, 2020, et cetera. It's, I wasn't caught flat-footed. It happened. Cool. Pivot, adjust, do what you got. Most companies, you know, look like it was Mike Tyson's punch out for if you're born in the eighties or seventies, <laughs> they got punched in the mouth. Like, uh, what do we do? Why weren't you ready to pivot? Right. Why weren't you reading all the trends almost every single trend that co that COVID and quarantine caused were trends that were already in the works, moving people more inside and working remote already in the works, selling digitally and engaging people di di uh, digitally already starting to happen. And I think too many people, because they didn't have that always optimizing mindset, got caught super flat-footed. Right. And some people thrived, some people didn't, some people managed through it. And most of us were probably that middle group. But I feel like sales in particular has moved too slow. And this is kind of a, just a, a, a lockstep move in the direction we already headed versus maybe yeah. a stair step. Okay. Well, this reminds me of guests we had on uh, last year, Mark Sanborn, and he talked about KPIs in an organization. And one of the primary KPIs that he recommends for organizations to evaluate is, are you meeting your potential? 
Because it's one thing to set that baseline that you're talking about. Great, I hit it. But are we still meeting the full potential that like we have? That. Yeah. So, so that that constant process of evaluating and retooling and trying to break and do it better. I, I love that approach. Um, I want to talk about the difference between personal brand and corporate brand. So you guys have a very successful organization, but you individually have really kind of carved out your own personal brand. And I want to talk about what that process has been like for you and what you think it can be like for others um, looking at this. I'm writing down that quote. I'm 100% Bart borrowing that. Yeah, steal it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit in the comments, maybe. Yeah, I'll tell you, man, it was a very, again, it goes back to, I think, again, one of the things that I've been good at in my career, I just, I, there are no sacred cows to me. Yeah. My life is one big evolution. And I really hope a lot of people have some of that, you know, you know, I find my moments of peace too. So don't worry about me, you know, but, but I, I, I love learning. I, I, just, I, I love reading. I, I, it's fun, you know? And, and so, you know, I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but I'll tell you what happened and this, cause this was a pivot, right? So look, my company, you know, we're, we're literally turning eight this year, right? So I've been doing this now for eight years. Um, this is May of 2018. So this, this time, this is ingrained, this is seared into my psyche. May of 2018, if you, many of you marketers or business owners, maybe you may or may not, there's a law that came out in Europe called GDPR, yeah. which was general data and privacy regulations or rights, I think what it was, which basically is a lot of spam laws. And by the way, just so you know, if you're in the US, marketers, you better get ready because I, I have a sneaky feeling with the Biden administration in particular, I think we're going to have something similar, not quite that tight, like what Canada has or what Europe, but just a little sidebar, a little, some, little Easter egg to get you thinking. Um, we put out this ebook. Joshua, this ebook was so good. We basically distilled the, the, this whole bill and law down to 10 pages for sales and marketing leaders. Here's what you need to know. It was like, you know, like a very, you know, kind of systematized step by step. Step by step. Yeah. And then, you know, you put it out on social, eh, does okay. And, and I, you know, I'm looking, I'm like, God, we're putting out blog posts every day. We're putting this stuff on social. Man, this is a lot of work. Like, why are we doing this? If this is really what it is. And then I had, there, it was literally an epiphany. And, and because I was doing what every CEO does, I was pushing everything to scale. Scaled, we're doing this. Scaled is this. Because I didn't want to be perceived as an egomaniac. I didn't want to be perceived as self-promoting. Yeah. And then I, but then I had the, the realization, Joshua, that people want to hear from people. And if my ship rises, scaled ship rises. And for at that moment, between summer of 2018 and summer of 2019, we put out zero blog posts uh -huh. and zero eBooks and went all in on posting every single day on LinkedIn. Okay. Every day, text posts, video, mixing it up, a lot of text posts. Um, and we were getting deals where people, we, we're talking six figure deals right? Multiple, multiple. I mean, this year we will close millions, plural, of dollars from organic inbound from free, F-R-E-E, -E, LinkedIn <laughs> posts. Yeah. We will generate from a view standpoint, I'll generate almost, I'll generate probably over 5 million views on LinkedIn for $0.00 that would cost my company over a million dollars in advertising. And what I just realized people wanted to hear from people that that's, that was the epiphany that I had and it's just playing itself out, sure. you know, and, and it's going to continue to play itself out in 2021. It's my biggest thing. If you as an organization can figure out how to harness the power of your employees, that is the future of marketing. The future of marketing is influencer marketing and your employees are the influencers. Love it. I think it was, uh, I, I may be misquoting this, but I think it was an Edelman uh, report that came out last year that talked about, I think it's 85% of consumers trust individuals over brands um and and you're you're living proof of it um you just you jumped the curve starting in 2018 <laughs> yeah i did a post about that like i, I had a chance i was uh, fortunate enough i had a meeting with uh, gary vaynerchuk in 2018 uh, right right october of 2018 and we talked about linkedin and at the time like, he was still kind of like dabbling with it but it was just i had the data i just saw the data i'm like holy right. crap like you know, you're getting all this reach and people are just reaching out and, and then, and then, and now again, it's been two and a half years, but, but the other thing I'll tell a lot of you, if you're, if you're nervous about putting yourself out there, 
I had no, I have no ego about this. Meaning I'm not, I, I know in my soul, I am not doing this to be famous. Yeah. If it, ha if, if I achieve a note, what that's an, uh, that's a, that's a con that's a consequence of it. I'm really right. doing it to add value. I believe that the things that most of you take for granted, most people don't actually know. And, and once you kind of, and so if post does well, data point, post does horrible data point. I've removed slowly all ego from it. And every post is about learning and every post is about growth uh, for me. And I learn and I, I repeat, rinse and repeat. So I think for a lot of you, if you're nervous about it, just think about it. You're doing it for your business. You're, you're probably not a, you know, an egomaniac who just wants fame and celebrity status. It's and not going to be on LinkedIn. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's kind of interesting, man. I tell you what I'm, I'm into now is Clubhouse, dude. I was up last night. I was on Clubhouse yesterday for four hours. Wow. I don't know if you all know Clubhouse or not yet, but it yeah. is blowing up. And I really feel like, man, it, it just hits the spot. It's like, it's got that little Instagram hustle realness to it. It's got that professional LinkedIn. It's got the voice, the podcast and the video, you know, kind of what we're doing, not the video component. It's kind of this weird in between, man, that I think is kind of scratching a, an itch that a lot of people have for kind of that interaction. So I'm digging it. Club, okay. Clubhouse, I think, has got some potential to be the, the next big thing. Good nugget. Good nugget. Um, all right. So I want to shift gears. We're going to do a quick fire round. Um, so just uh, impulse, impulse responses. Uh, favorite podcast right now? Uh, I'm going to go... Gary V audio experience, uh, okay. Tim Ferriss. I love Tim Ferriss's podcast too. Yeah. Okay. Um, who's your favorite professional inspiration? Professional inspiration. I mean, who inspires me to be better as a professional? Again, I don't want to be cliche and say, I really, again, I really, I enjoy Gary V's content. I think the guy has got the right, like mental mindset. I don't know, man. I think my, maybe myself, I, I don't know. Like I, 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 like I, and maybe that's, again, that sounds bad after I just said not being an egomaniac, but you know, like, I don't, I don't look at a lot of other, you know, like I, 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 I like what a lot of people are doing. I think a lot of people have a lot to share and everyone has a voice and I'm really proud of the work that I'm putting out and the work that we're putting out too. Um, you know, but I love all those guys, Any, anyone out there preaching, um, you know, Tony, it's Tony Robbins. There's a, there's a guy I, I got introduced to last year called Michael Singer. If you know, he wrote a book called The Surrender Experiment and his book before that was The Untethered Soul. Okay. Um, I, he, I'd say he would be someone that I'm kind of like, man, this guy's got it figured out. Right. You know, Michael Singer, if you, don't, if you don't know who he is, check out those books. The Surrender Experiment, I think, is just a phenomenal book. Okay, that's a good one, uh, which bleeds into favorite book right now. So maybe it's that. Uh, <laughs> no, favorite, favorite, no, favorite book right now. I've already read that book. Uh, favorite book right now. I'm reading kind of part of two, two books. The first I'll mention, uh, and a friend of mine wrote it. It's getting crazy. It literally dropped uh, yesterday. It's called Black Buck. And it's a story about a black man in sales, in tech, uh, a fiction book with, with a little bit too much truth in it. Um, okay. And so if you want a good read with some learning too, go check out Black Buck, uh, Mateo Ascaport, good, good friend of mine. Um, and maybe another book. Right now, uh, at, ooh, this one for sure. Uh, your next, it's called Your Next Five Moves. And it's by uh, Patrick Bet David. And it's, it's basically a book that talks about applying chess kind of principles about sure. if as a business, you're able to look five moves ahead, yep. you're going to outpace the competition. So five moves ahead, black buck, go read them. Okay, I like it. Um, early riser or burning the midnight oil? Uh, both. <laughs> I would say I'd probably lean on the side of the, the midnight oil person now, but I, I'm kind of like a, a season. I don't know. I just kind of do what I do what I need to do. You know what I mean? But I'm a mix. I mean, I, I would say I'm probably more of a midnight oil person. Okay. All right. Uh, favorite pizza. Well, I'm allergic to gluten. So I feel like as of eight years ago, my opinion stopped counting on this topic. <laughs> but if my, my go-to is a pepperoni, black olive, and mushroom pizza. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I like one out of those three. So, uh, oh I, man, I, what, I which one? I'm, fungus. Which one? I, I'm just not, I'm not big on the olives or mushrooms, but oh, pretty much, man. pretty much anything else I'm game for, but, uh, all right. 
Okay, so I get you I, some mushrooms, man. Like not, not those kind of mushrooms. That's a different kind of conversation we can yeah, have. Well, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, so we know both of them. So. Yeah, yeah. I see the craft breweries behind you there, man. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so the thing that really caught my attention back in April, you posted a pretty lengthy LinkedIn post um, that really uh, it was called "Rebuilding Your Outbound Strategy." So I want to walk through each one of these components, um, get your thoughts on it from where you thought about it originally to maybe where it's at now, looking into 2021. So the first one was focusing on empathy versus pleasantries. And this one really stuck to my heart because training sales teams in my personal experience, I've always talked about, hey, take your sales hat off on and put the business owner's hat on that you're talking to. Really understand their business, understand their needs, understand what their, their budgets are. Like really think about it, but most people don't do that. And if there's ever been a time to really focus on that, it is now. So I love that first one. Yeah. I'll tell you that it, it, honestly, I mean, here we are now almost, you know, nine, 10 months later, and I think people still haven't figured this out. It's, I think it's more true. Well, here's what I saw happen in COVID that people, and again, cause you nailed it when you said business, you got, I have to know their business. There were three buckets when COVID hit companies there. Go look at the stock market, my friends, go look, guess what? The world didn't implode, right? It wasn't like there are companies that and sectors that destroyed it during COVID. There are other ones that did really bad. And there are some that in between. And the problem is, was the with, when the pleasantries is everyone put everyone in the everything's bad bucket. Oh, times are tough. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, sure. Blah, blah. I'm not going to No, this company is crushing it. They're doing well. I'm going to try to sell these people. Right. And, and I feel like too many people, they weren't being smart and they're still not being smart about their outreach. They're still giving themselves excuses, right. saying time to, look, we're in a home office. So what? Deal with it. It's not changing. Sure. Suck it up. Okay. Like, guess what? Business is still happening. Go look at the stock market. And if you go, oh, the stock market's fake. I don't give a shit. Whatever you think. Okay. Business is still happening. Companies are doing well. People are making money. So don't give yourself the cop out and the everything's bad pleasantries real empathy is knowing where where that person is not making generalizations about everybody and that's the disconnect a lot of people they think pleasantries is like or you know empathy is is sympathy and it's not and you're they're overly sympathetic and looping everyone into this horrible world versus actually some people are doing really really well and are you adapting your style to those the, those groups Okay. Well, and this actually leads into one of the other ones that you had. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead here, but it is dividing buyers and prospects, right? So you have the yeah. people that are doing okay now or are doing fantastic versus the people that they're struggling right now. They're still a qualified lead, but maybe not right now. So we need to think of them in different approaches. That's right. And let me just, maybe this is be a light, maybe this will be a light bulb for some. It's always been like this. There's just a lot more people in the not ready to buy bucket now. Okay. You should always be running a short, mid, and long-term funnel as a rep, as a department, as a company. Right. The mix just shifted. And too many people shifted everyone into the nurture bucket. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, and so I think that that's my hopeful takeaway is guess what? Because remember, sales leaders were always like, you know, I feel like, if sales leaders got to look alike, whatever, from some predictive analytics tool, they're like, everyone's a buyer. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, it's like, no, they weren't. They weren't qualified then either. They're, they're not qualified now either. And these sectors are not doing well. So you need to make sure you have a, what is your nurturing plan for someone who's not going to be ready to buy for six, 12, 24 months? That's bucket one. Bucket two, what are the people that we need to like automate, but maybe have a little bit of human in the loop sure. for a three to six month? Bucket one or bucket three, qual qualified, ready to move forward now. It's always been that. You've, your pipeline has always had those three buckets. It's just now it's been exacerbated because a lot of people are kind of realistically in that that you know that first bucket that I mentioned. So I think it's, I don't think that it's, again, this goes back to like when, when COVID hit, I'm like, okay, it is what it is. Like people just, it's still the same game. And so I hope a lot of people coming out of this keep that, keep that mindset. Okay. Um, I want to take a little side path here because it's one of the topics that it jogged my memory, which is when things did go sideways, I felt like a lot of organizations 
went from staying in their their lane and their core competency to hey we've lost you know half or two thirds of our core competency of business so hey we're going to go outside in the fringes and we're going to start grabbing some business that we otherwise wouldn't take what are you seeing right now as far as telling people to get back to the comfort of saying no so that they can really stay focused on their core competency and get that business that really is is more valuable to them man it's such a personal, you know, business specific choice that I, I hate to, to offer too much advice on it because you got to do what you got to do. You know, if, that, if you, but you got to be honest, you also have to be honest with yourself. Are you trying to regrow this because of your ego, your mad, your revenues took a hit. You had to lay a few people off and you want to get back to that. And that's why you're taking this. Or is this a new opportunity, right? If it's a new opportunity, and something you want to pursue, then most likely great. Then you should be thinking about how do you make that a new competency. If it's a distraction and you're just taking the business to, I don't want to say for ego or you don't need it, you know, I mean, obviously you need it probably, but you, you, it's not where you want to go and you're okay with the size that you're at now. And, you know, you'll let time play out and time works things out. Then I'd say it's probably bad money. But, but I think it's a very personal decision, but maybe that's a lens that you can kind of evaluate why you're taking that side business on. Okay. Um, so we'll get back into the lane and we will talk about um, positioning your solution for actual problems. And I just heard you talk on one of this and the, the takeaway I had was, hey, if you don't know how your solution actually solves their real problem, what are you doing? Why, why are you even, you know, why are you even attempting this? Well, I just... I don't know. This goes back to being an, an, an again, my, it was Kaya is what my mom called me. Know it all. By the way, don't call your kids a know it all. It's not nice. Um, uh, I just don't, it's why I'm a pain in the ass at times. I just don't see problems, man. I, I have, I have this image. I don't know when this thing formed, but it's a castle wall almost. It's like a cartoon type castle wall. And I can take a step back and I look and I see a door that's 200 yards that way. I see a rope. I see a ladder. I see me trying to charge through it. I, my friends, the answer to all your problems, let me just, I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to drop this first. Fine. There's a real simple answer. It's called Google YouTube. Okay. 99.99% of things have already been solved. Whatever that problem is, whatever this business issue is that you're facing, it's Google and YouTube. Okay. And so if you're like, Hey, what are the COVID trends with my product? Hey, what are the code? Like, let's say you sell an end endpoint mobile security system. I don't know where I came up with that, but let's roll with that. Okay. And you're like, Hmm, I wonder what's the trends are and what, why people are buying it now. Google YouTube endpoint mobile security during COVID. And my friends, you're going to find a plethora of information. And guess what? That's your new sales pitch. Right. I think too many people just because they couldn't use their old value prop, they, they just saw the castle wall. They didn't realize, you know, and I'll, I'll give you some very, very real examples. If I showed you some of the numbers from our clients during COVID, and these are all over the sector, they are killing it. And I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back. One of our consultants just send over a recap every month. They send out a kind of a recap of the... <laughs> And it's because you got to change. It's the same product, but how the problem you solve might be different. So a couple of, let me, let me give you some very real examples. Okay. You were an IT services company. Well, now you're an in-home network security company. That's it. Same thing. I remember very, very early on, maybe in the first, it might've been even in late March or early April of COVID. I was doing a LinkedIn live and this gentleman came on and he sold office furniture. I'm like, dude, you must be killing it right now. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, dude, in-home office furniture, everybody needs to upgrade their office. Like, and he's like, no, man, we're getting crushed. And I was like, dude, you need to change. You got to fix your mind, man. Yeah. Every executive right now, you know, like every single executive right now is like, Hey man, I got this work at home office. It was cool. when I was there every once in a while. I just think people have a, a perspective at times. And, it, and again, if, you, if you're struggling for, for that perspective, Google YouTube, right? right. <laughs> you don't have to be the person to come up with all the great ideas. But, but I just think that uh, there hasn't been an industry yet outside of travel and hospitality. And maybe there's, there's, def there's certainly some more that I'm not thinking about where 
the answer, and even I've seen some hospitality and travel companies do an amazing job of pivoting. They might've had to cut, you know, three fourths of their staff, but now, you know, now they're travel plus travel risk management. That's smart, you know? And so I I just think, you know, you've got to, you've got to adapt your value prop, but it goes back to what we talked about earlier, man. If you always have that mindset of adapting, this is just a, another flavor of it. Just a more, more, (laughs) it just, needed to happen right now versus, you know, happening over three to six months. Okay. Well, I love it. I used to have a graphic designer that I would lean on. Hey, Angie, how do I do this? And she's like, what would Google say? And so like, I I just know that there's so many answers and so many people just get stuck staring at a white piece of paper when there's hundreds, if not thousands of people that have already solved that problem. And they've already, they posted it. It's there for you. I don't know. I don't, my son's six. He just started kindergarten. I hope to God one of the biggest classes that he has to go to is how to Google stuff. Like, I really feel like, wait, why are you teaching my kid X, Y, Z? Teach him how to do Boolean searches in Google. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like too many of us, and we're not taught this in college. Why are colleges not teaching this? That, that, I mean, forget, again, I want my kindergartner to, to learn this, yeah. but colleges, like, why isn't there just a whole thing on how to find information and not recreate the wheel? That's a new college class that everyone should start. How to not think of any original thought and reinvent the wheel and get shit done. Yeah. I, so it, it reminds me there was a, a bond that was up for, uh, for voting. And this is probably six or seven years ago within our, our kids' school district. And it was like, hey, do we rebuild the library, right? The community library. And the money, right? I don't know how many millions it was. And I'm like, you could give every child a tablet for like the right. next like five years for what it would cost. And it would be so much more applicable. Now, don't get me wrong. I love libraries. I love books, but- All right, me too. But we're talking about today's application and it's just evolve or or don't, right? So- Yeah, man. What, or, dude, if my kid, here, here's the thing. I will flip this desk over if they try to teach my kid the Dewey Decimal System. If my kid has to learn, and I don't know if, if, if my kid has to learn the Dewey Decimal System. Yeah. I mean, my God, what are we doing, people? Right. Okay, so next one is LinkedIn. Um, and you've already touched on it, but I mean, let's talk about it in, in further because I do think um, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of voyeurs on LinkedIn, uh, right? There's, there's a lot of people that I feel like when people go and they post content and they don't see the number of likes, they don't see the comments that they're expecting, they feel like, hey, it's for naught. But I literally had a client call, yes, or a prospect call yesterday. I said, hey, can I get your information? He's like, hey, we're connected on LinkedIn. I've actually seen all the videos you've been doing lately. Now, he didn't comment and he didn't like, but he actually was paying attention. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think early on, just know that you're learning, right? It's like me on Clubhouse. Why did I, why did I get on Clubhouse for four hours last night? I'm learning. I put out a post, I'm learning. You know, I do a, a room. One night, 12 people showed up. The next night, five people. Okay. You know, look, is there a little internal part of me? You know, I'm not going to like, because, oh man, why didn't more people show up? But, (laughs) but, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, I trust, I think that I'm a capable enough human that I will figure it out to the best of my ability and I'll, and I'll do my best. And, And why I stayed on so late last night was like, I was listening. I'm like, man, this person is a, oh shoot the way that I do it on LinkedIn and Instagram, where it's more of me talking clubhouse is more about facilitating it, man, you know, am I a good facilitator? So it's to me, if you make, if you make it about, and I talk about this, I'm a curious person. I like to learn. And if you kind of can take that, I call it the beginner mind. Um, uh, you take a beginner mind to, to, to anything new, you're, you're going to be in a good spot. So that's my advice to anyone early on. Take a beginner's mind to it. Don't expect that you're going to hit a home run. Get, get versed in some things. I'll, notice, I'll give you two very tactical tips sure. just because these are kind of the, the most common mistakes that people who are, who are new on posting. One is don't reshare posts or share links. LinkedIn's algorithm hates it. The reason you're not getting an interaction, LinkedIn wants original. They want you. They want your thoughts. Yeah. That's why my GDPR ebook bombed. You know, they wanted me to just do a post about the 10 things on GDPR. Yeah. Um, and they could go read the book some other day that, you know, they won't. When's the last time anybody read an ebook? If you're really honest with yourself, by the way. Um, and so years. that's exactly. Or how about, how about like how many blog posts do you have saved? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, 
Um, so, so that's it. When you're early on, you take that beginner mind, you test, you do some things, don't reshare posts, do that. Just be okay with putting your own thoughts out there. And that's it. And then over time, you get a little bit more bold. And if you did, but if you take that mindset of like, look, I need to post this as my opinion. And I put the cop, maybe I put the article in the, in the comments. Cool. Do that. Yeah. No problem with that. But, but that that's probably the kind of the, the top mistake that a lot of people make. The other thing is don't be stingy with your connections. Your network most likely is comprised primarily of coworkers and previous coworkers. If you are trying to grow your audience, you need to start to add your connections. I'd highly invest. I don't get paid by LinkedIn sales navigator, but 60 or 70 bucks a month, you can go and build very targeted lists of people. Let's say for me, we sell to CEOs, VPs of sales, VPs of marketing, CROs, CMOs. That's our target audience, right? Um, and so look, when I started in May in 2018, I had 8,000 followers. Now I have almost 50, right? And guess what? To go from eight to 20, I've worked my butt. I, I connected with people. Yeah. I, they didn't just didn't show up magically because of my, my content was so good that everyone magically was beating down my door. No, I was connecting with you know 50 to 100 people every day. And with Sales, Nav Sales Navigator, I could do that in 15 minutes. Right. So, you know, that that's just, I think, a couple of pieces of advice that as you're getting started, I think it help a lot of people. Well, so I'm going to add a couple of things here, uh, one of which is my thought process. I didn't know you two weeks ago. I saw this content and I reached out to you and now you're on the show. Um, so my, my message to people is don't be afraid, right? Don't, don't feel like people are out of touch. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, right? I don't know if Gary Vee is gonna, gonna take my first call, uh, but that leads me into my second thing, which is I think there's the traditional way, but I just heard you talk about something uh, leveraging LinkedIn in comments and posts where you tag people in a post versus trying to DM them. <laughs> yeah. Sh share this. Yeah, this is the new, new, this is that you're talking, this is the new, new Joshua. Uh, so a couple strategies that are working extremely well. Um, so I've been calling it the, the dating lens. Most professional interactions, if you treat them similar to how you would treat a first few dates, you're probably behaving correctly. Okay. And so whether it's in a meeting, a professional meeting where you start off and you go, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me today. I really stop, stop being desperate. Or you go into the DMs immediately after someone connects. Oh, Jake, I'm so glad we're connected. I, I see a lot of synergies. Would you do either of those things in a dating scenario? No, you would not. I hope not. I hope you would not do that. Sit down. At the Can you imagine that you sit down across from someone for the first time? Oh, hey, thank you so much for taking a date with me. I, I really appreciate you taking yeah. the time. So, so the, you know, the, the strategy is how can you build a little bit of, you know, call it affinity relationship capital with someone before you direct message them or get them to engage. So there's two, two quick things. And again, just, just give a mindset kind of, uh, you know, uh, example here. It's one that we've used that's been very successful is you, you kind of look at someone's LinkedIn profile or something on their company, you, you write a post about a, that, like a related topic, and then you tag that person in the comments. You know, hey, I, all, I saw Bo Brooks doing this really, really well. Shout out to, to him and the team. Boom, right? And then we've seen, boom, that person will comment back. Oh, thanks. And then you can go in. Hey, Bo, like actually, hey, when you commented, I saw this and, and then, hey, I thought there might be some serendipity here. Is it, is it cool? A lot of the call to action, this is a really important one. So that call to action from that is actually, is it okay if I send you a little bit more detail on what we're up to? And if it makes sense, we'll set up time to meet next week. So we're actually seeing a little bit softer call to action okay. work quite a bit more to get positive replies. So there's that. Then if someone's not active on LinkedIn, which a lot, most people aren't, what you're going to be totally shocked by is if you go to their activity, right? Keep in mind, LinkedIn's the only platform where you can see people's everything they like and everything they comment. And most of you are like, wait, they can do that? Yes, they can. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so imagine I go into your, your activity, Joshua, and I see a theme of posts that you like or interact with. What do I do? Maybe for the first week, I interact with those posts too. Right. Maybe I comment on your comment. And then God forbid you wait a week and a half to DM somebody. Yeah. And then I DM you and I say, Hey, Joshua, I saw that you're into this. I'm into this too. Glad we could get connected here. And then God forbid I wait four days to where another thing happens. And then I DM you about I said, something similar. So, you know, what we're trying to push a lot of companies to do is really just have a mindset of, of 
it's just, can you, can you wait 10 days for the call to action? Right. Can, can you stop yourself from being, you know, again, if it was dating, we call it thirsty, right? In the professional world, we call it, you know, desperate, right? Like, and so I think a lot of you, again, that's why I like that idea of kind of applying these principles, <laughs> no matter, you know, what, what it is, but, but I hope that that helps some folks. Well, I love the dating thing because I, I'm just going to take this and apply it to what I see 95% of the time when I get connections coming to me. It is the, you know, and, and I'm using the dating metaphor here. It is the girl's like, hey, I'd love to go on a date with you. And as soon as we sit down at the table, she's like, let me tell you how great I am at fashion. I am the best fashion person in the world and it's going to make you so happy. And I'm like, what, what? what is happening right now? Like, I thought we were just like getting to know one another. Exactly. And instead it's me, 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 Like, you, wait, you think there's synergies. Uh, how do you think there's synergies? Correct. You know, it, this guy sent me a note. I sent him a note back and he fired the company. You know, it's obviously he's using some LinkedIn bot or service. And it was like, hey, Jake is a, a, a roofing company owner. I'm like, you know, it's like people, it, I, I really feel like, and I, I've said this before, if I was an SDR, sales development rep, outbound rep, whatever it is, I think I could set my entire week's worth of meetings at about four hours a week. I'm pretty sure because people are so damn lazy and not doing anything personalized. They don't know the businesses. They don't know what these people do. That if you just did LinkedIn voicemails, you did videos or DMs or commented, I think you'd crush your number in a half to full day a week. And just people right now are just going through the motions. We have all this new sales tech sure. and what it's actually caused is people we dumb people down, told them to go push buttons on a machine as opposed to activating the human mind, which is what we should be, what we should be doing more of in sales. hundred um, percent. So leading into that one is, and mind you, this is back in April, but it's don't be cheap, focus on the experience, right? And I think a lot of people automatically, oh, too, hey, I'm going to discount it because we know everybody's struggling right now. But really, and this is something that you were harping on at the beginning of last year, which is we really need to focus on the customer experience. We really mm -hmm. need to focus on improving that. Um, where are you seeing that where we are at today? Man, I love that. It's kind of fun going back and reminiscing on some of this stuff a little bit. I like it. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting that, you know, that was something, you know, pre-COVID we were talking, I was talking, I still am talking a lot about, which is, you know, is your sales or marketing experience designed to be customer centric or how you want customers to behave? And obviously it's, it's a, it, it, don't get it twisted. It's a mix, right? Yeah. But I think too many people, they design a process and then expect customers to fit the process as opposed to understanding what's the most optimal way that these customers want to experience us. Yeah. And then how do we tweak that? So it's kind of just like reverse engineering it. I'll tell you, I'm going to add a wrinkle to it that I've, you know, we literally all of a sudden this has just taken off. So if anybody's listening and they want to learn more about it, I'm happy to around October ish. Some of our clients were like, they've got the field reps teams or maybe field. Or they did a lot of relationship type selling, et cetera. So now that we're experiencing these little something different, which is these people are just like, what do I do? I, I built my network through referrals and trade shows. And what do I do? And I, what I realized is, man, that telesales experience that I had back in college when I was slanging vacation, I, I, I trained myself how to paint a story and a picture with just words and a narrative. And, you know, I read Zig Ziglar is a classic one on sales and tell, kind of talks about the storytelling of sales. Um, but to make a long story short, um, what I'm focused on a lot now is the same thing, the customer experience, but also what is your digital sales experience? Meaning, is it fun? Is it interesting or is it just like, you know, I, did, I posted about this a few days ago, which is, I think I said 80%, it's probably 90% of your prospects are emailing while they're on the phone with you. And you know, the really sad part, my sales friends, probably half of you are doing the same thing. There's no, you're not focused on the conversation, making it fun. So one of the, some of the things we're talking about now is as soon as the conversation starts, start sharing your screen. Maybe you've got an article pulled up from their website or a share from an influencer. you got to get people, we've got to realize sales has got to be about the experience. Again, imagine now for a meeting, I send you two or three pieces of content that I know are relevant in advance. Hey, Joshua, looking forward to our meeting on Tuesday. Here's a really cool post I saw yesterday from another VP of operations. Thought you might find some value in it. Catch up Tuesday. Yeah. Boom. Then we sit down and say, hey, great. So Joshua, I'm going to share my screen as we I'm gonna ask you a few questions here. What if you, sh what if you show yourself typing? What if you digitally whiteboard with them this solution? And then afterwards, you connect with all the people on LinkedIn. Maybe instead of sending an email recap, you do a little 
quick two minute video on Vidyard. Yeah. We've got to bring the experience. We are all locked in this Zoom environment, this Microsoft Teams environment, Slack. And I think sales, I think it's good. It's very easy to stand out and differentiate if you do some of the things I just talked about. So it, again, it really helps with those customer, you know, uh, customer engagement, customer experience and making it more pleasant for them. Well, I love the digital whiteboard. It's uh, we have teaching Friday. So tomorrow I'm actually bringing some of the things that you've talked about. Um, and one of them was, Hey, you know, aside from just having screens up and you're, you're looking at people, put your discovery board on there and actually enter it in in real time so that they're seeing it and you can ask and get engagement and you're tying them into the experience in a way that most organizations and by most, I mean, probably all are not doing right now. That's right. And again, you can literally go and start doing this. You can hit, go ahead, hit pause on the podcast and just start doing this right now. Yeah. Like all of these things are things that we're talking about where, again, it goes back to, do you have a, you know, are you, are you being flexible? Are you, are you responding to the environment, you know, or are you, you know, just kind of doing the same things and going through the motions um, as opposed to pivoting? All right. So the last one from your post is put down the script but I'm going to twist this a little bit and I'm going to tie it into kind of where we started at the beginning at career builder, which is where's the fine line between a sales process and a script, right? I mean, you, I, I know you now an hour in, right? I can mm -hmm. feel you, you've got a good gut feel for, you know, a situation and environment you can rift pretty good, but there's a lot of what you're doing that I know was a foundation of process over time where, where does that live? How, how do you float in between those two spaces? Yeah, a lot, super question. And it really kind of ties home a lot of the themes or things that we've talked about. You know, and, and when I say it's, it, there are so many best practices out there. And, that, and that's where the script comes from. It's the same, same as a story that I told before about my, you know, boss's boss, Evan Ross, shout out to Evan, um, that until you have a benchmark or a baseline, a process, how do you know if you're good or not? Like without a script and a process, you have nothing to build on. Right. You're building on sand because it's always changing, et cetera. So how I think about a script is it's a guidepost, you know, and, and I, 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 I tell everybody this to me, a script is freeing and people are like, well, what do you mean? Well, so many discovery conversations, you think they're a conversation, but if you, and not enough people listen to their calls. You go back and listen to your calls, you sound like you're schizophrenic. You're going from this topic to this topic. You're just being led around, like they've got a leash on you. They're taking you wherever they wanna go. Right. That's not the conversation I have or ever have. Look, you, in the very first question, I talked to you about your role and your organization. You tell me about your problems and challenges. I don't take that bait. Cool, okay. Let's go back to your department and your role. And then guess what? I intro that next section. Okay, great, so now let's talk about priorities. So earlier you mentioned this, this, and this, let's talk about that now. So I have a structured conversation with somebody. I don't have a, a, a free flow conversation, but it feels free flowing. Yeah. And so that's where I feel like a script. The other thing a script does, we as human, we can't actually multitask. We suck at it yeah. and we think we're good at it. So if you are simultaneously listening, processing and thinking about the next question to ask, you are not fully present. Yeah. What having a script does is I'm, I'm here, I'm with you. I already know what I'm gonna say next. So I don't need to even think about that. I can actually hear what you're saying and say, okay, actually Joshua, let's go a little bit deeper there. Cause I can hear your intonation. I can see your, you know, your eyebrow move or something as opposed to, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's great. Because I'm trying to, now I'm like, uh, the next question. Right. So, so don't be allergic to scripts. And then over time you evolve it, you write it in your own language. Sure. But don't miss the core tenets of the process. The process is the process for a reason. Like I said, you know, we're not training a thousand people on this because it doesn't work, you know? And so it goes back to like, if, if there's a process you find on Google or YouTube and you don't have one and somebody says this process works, why not try it? I don't know. Why not? You know, like, and so I, I just, you know, it's ego, ego. I already know why you don't. It's ego. You think that, you know, but you may or may not. Um, but that's my advice is that you start with the foundation and you build from it. You don't all of a sudden throw it out because you've done it. I've done, I was trying to calculate this probably at least five, four to 5,000 sales meetings in my career, at least, at least. And I do the same thing in every one. 
it's the same, right? It's the same thing. I have the same agenda. That's so, so, I mean, I, I, again, it's how about this? It's 85% the same. Fair. Because yes. the process is the process. It right. works. And I know that it works. And I've proven that it's going to work across thousands of reps and hundreds and hundreds of companies. Like, so I, I, that, that's where I say start with a foundation and build from it and, and, and make tweaks to it. But don't throw the, of course, it sounds awkward. You've only said it three times. You're learning a speech, you know, God, I mean, why don't, why don't we learn anything from professional speakers? Do you think they get up and wing it? Are you delusional? They sound like they're winging it because they've rehearsed. They can be present. They can sound natural, you know? So apologies for that interruption. Um, <clears throat> it does no. remind me of, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to, to Dirk Zeller guy I met in um, Napa. So he was a keynote speaker and he, he explained to the crowd how he had sold more homes to one client than all of his other clients combined. And so he asked the audience, like, who do you think that is? And one person got it. It was his wife. So he practiced it, right? He knew, he understood he had a right process and he understood he might rift a little bit here and there. And he did it in real time with the crowd, right? He, he led them, you know, like they had collars and a leash, but he rifted because he was comfortable with it because he went so many times over and over to the point where it was natural, right? Exactly. He didn't have to look down at it and go page by page. He just stayed in the moment. That's right. And don't be frustrated that you don't sound natural. I know anytime I've, done, I've, I've invented and reinvented so many pitches and different things and that I just know it's a part of the learning curve. I'm going to suck at it at first and clubhouse, you know, like it's just, everything is new. And so I just think, you know, whether it's posting on LinkedIn or your sales pitch, don't, you know, that that's the work that it takes. That's excellence requires blood, sweat, and tears. And so if you want to be excellent or sound amazing or whatever, you better be willing to put in the work. And that's, that's what you, the gentleman you mentioned, yeah. you know, did. Okay. So uh, last, last one here. Is there anything you think that we haven't covered that is topical right now um, for, for businesses out there? Yeah, for me, I, I think most companies right now are under investing in sales technology um, or, or, or they've over invested and in not using it correctly that, you know, I just want to put this in perspective for a lot of you. There are over, I don't, I haven't seen the 20, they, they do an annual report. I want to say there's probably about 1700 sales technologies now. And if you're a marketer and a marketing, like, I don't need to tell you how many marketing technologies there are, right? But sales is kind of on that same trajectory as MarTech was back in 2009. So yeah. just kind of think about where we're at in that. So there's a high likelihood that if you're like, I wonder if there's a way that I could blah, blah, blah. Yes, there is. <laughs> you know, like if you're, if you're, people are doing way too many things manual and, and funny part is they're like automating the things they shouldn't <laughs> and, and manually doing things that they shouldn't, you know? And, and so, you know, whereas they, a lot of things, like there's so many different automation rules and things to do the mi mundane stuff. So like we talked about nurturing based on someone's disposition, can I automatically put them in one or two or three buckets to where it's like active plus, you know, passive, passive plus a little bit of active, pure passive. There's just so much that you can do and in investing time to, um, increase your sales organization's effectiveness versus adding more people, uh, I really feel like is how we're going to scale going forward. So just really think about, you know, what are all the different small little details that you're manually doing? Yeah. And I'm, and just like, you know, what's that saying? There's an app for that, right? There yeah. is a tech for that. So that, that would be the one thing we haven't talked about that, you know, I think everyone should have on their radar. Well, I like how you had both of those though, right? there's something out there, but there's also things that are out there that you're not utilizing, right? So look at it from both ends of the spectrum. So absolutely. All right, Jake, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to having you back again. Awesome. Me too, man. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.